The Black Army of Hungary is considered one of the most effective mercenary forces of the late Middle Ages, when Hungary was under constant threat from north, south and west. The King of Hungary found in the Black Army what he needed, a fighting force of stout discipline and dedication. In this video we explore how contemporary historiography tells the story of the Black Army of Hungary. The Kingdom of Hungary was facing a new problem in the 15th century. The Ottoman Empire had been expanding ever since it set foot on the stage of history. Gradually, it began threatening various polities in Europe in the 14th and 15th century. In most pitched battles throughout these years, the Hungarians usually found themselves on the losing side. For example, at the Battle of Varna in 1444, in which a European coalition attempted to stop the Ottoman expansion into the Balkans, but failed. Only four years later, in 1448, at the Second Battle of Kosovo, a Hungarian-led force tried to avenge the defeat at Varna, but the Ottomans came out on top again. One last obstacle for the Ottoman expansion westward were the walls of Constantinople. Until 1453, these had deterred the growing empire, but then Mehmed II conquered the city. The last remaining pieces of the Eastern Roman Empire ceased to exist. With that, the Ottomans established an even firmer grip on the Balkans. Now, the way into Europe was wide open. Next on the Ottomans' list were the Venetians and the kingdoms on the Balkans, among them the Kingdom of Hungary. Now, the Kingdom of Hungary came under constant military pressure by the Ottomans. Generally speaking, the Ottoman-Hungarian wars were not mainly characterized by major armed clashes and operations. There were, of course, a few major pitched battles and sieges. But Colin Imber, an expert on the Ottoman Empire, is right in pointing out that the Ottomans conducted a continuous small war in the Balkans. The term small war refers to small-scale military operations which took place on a daily basis in territories surrounding contested frontiers as well as in the vicinity of sieges and battles. We covered the topic of small war in a separate video, link is in the top right corner. In the case of the Ottoman-Hungarian wars, this meant that the Ottomans used mostly irregular local troops to raid and pillage towns and villages, and to abduct people in order to sell them on the slave markets. Such raids were very lucrative for the Ottoman border princes, because they could yield up to several thousand prisoners. So the technical term small war should not be misunderstood. These raids were a major threat to the integrity of the Hungarian kingdom because they threatened to slowly chip away at the population and the financial resources. The historian Tamás Palosfalvi notes, quote, Realizing the potential destructive consequences of this problem, the military reforms of successive Hungarian governments were all aimed at finding a way of preventing the gradual erosion of the country's human and financial resources." End quote. The Hungarians put in place a set of means to combat this new problem on the southern border. A zone of buffer states, a line of defensive border fortresses, an improved levy system and lastly, an emphasis on light cavalry. The pressure to reform and react to the constant Ottoman raids also gave rise to the Black Army. But it was not just a reaction to the Ottoman Empire. In 1458, Matthias Huniadi emerged as new king of Hungary. He became known in Latin as Matthias Corvinus, or translated into English Matthias the Raven. Matthias was confronted with several problems. In the south, the Ottomans were as eager as ever to conquer his kingdom. In the north, a band of Hussite mercenaries, mostly Czechs and Moravians, were marauding the lands of Upper Hungary. The term Hussite refers to the followers of the religious reformer Jan Hus, who rose against the Catholic Church and the establishment, which resulted in the so-called Hussite Wars in the middle of the 15th century. We made another video on this topic, which you can find linked in the top right corner. Although the Hussite heydays were over, Remnants of their troops were still raiding and pillaging Matthias's territories. Matthias's third problem came from some important nobles, who had turned against him because they were in favor of the Habsburg ruler Frederick III as Hungarian king. Frederick had not only claimed the Hungarian crown, but worse for Matthias, was actually in possession of the physical crown of Hungary, 
the crown of Saint Stephen. It had been brought into Frederick's possession by Elizabeth of Luxembourg, the mother of Ladislav Posthumus. Without the crown, Matthias could not really be sure that he was seen as the rightful king of Hungary. But Frederick III obviously was not very willing to give it to him, and happily kept it as a most precious bargaining chip. So Matthias had three main goals when he was elected king. Firstly, he had to regain the physical crown of Hungary so he could be coronated properly. Secondly, he needed to pacify Upper Hungary. And thirdly, he had to deter the Ottomans in the south. To achieve these goals, he needed a military force much more reliable and stronger than the regular Army of Hungary. And here's where the Black Army enters the stage. At the time, the Hungarian state had a system of organizing knights and men-at-arms for military service, but it still relied mostly on nobles to recruit and equip their own men at their own expenses. This system was called Banderium. In addition, the nobles were required to equip one archer presumably mounted for every 20 peasant plots. This latter form of recruitment formed an additional body of troops in times of crisis and was known as Militia Portalis. Later on, some changes were made to this system, but overall it remained under use during Matthias's reign. However, Matthias needed a professional force, reliable in terms of quality and availability. The kind of man he needed might have been bred in the Hussite wars to the north. But unfortunately, they were fighting against him, not for him. Because one of their leaders, Jan Giskra, favored Frederick III over Matthias. Meanwhile, the Ottomans gradually conquered and subdued the territories to the south. Matthias had to bring the ongoing peace negotiations with Frederick III to an end. So he offered Frederick and Giskra a hefty payment which scored him not only the crown he needed so desperately, but also the services of Jan Giskra and his mercenary forces. While this put a major strain on the treasury, it was enough to pacify Upper Hungary. These former marauders were the first recruits of Matthias's nascent mercenary army, later known as Black Army. However, the Black Army wasn't formed at once. It grew and developed over the course of the next decades. According to Tomasz Palosvalvi, it only really became, quote, a permanent institution in the 1470s, with numbers altering according to the aims and directions of campaigns, end quote. The name Black Army wasn't actually used until it had already been disbanded. And we don't really know what it referred to. One hypothesis is that the name came from a famous captain who was called John the Black Pogwitz. Another idea is that it referred to their black armor, but the consensus among scholars seems to be that this is unlikely, because King Matthias himself informs us in a letter to the Bishop of Ega that the black army was not a uniform force at all, neither in appearance nor composition. While this letter doesn't answer the question of etymology, it provides much information about the army itself. Matthias Carvinus explains that the army consisted both of heavy and light cavalry, master gunners and infantry. Generally speaking, the men had different ethnic backgrounds. At the beginning, most of them were Czechs, Moravians, Poles and Germans. Later on though, Hungarians were recruited as well. The infantry was divided into a common and an armored infantry. The armored branch was referred to as armati, which is Latin and translates to armed or armored ones. Most likely, both types used a variety of weapons such as spears, pikes and halberds. The armati were supported by the clipeati, shield bearers, who used large shields that were common during that period. Matthias mentions that they formed a circle which had, quote, the appearance of a fort, from which the infantry fights almost as if from behind bastion walls or ramparts, end quote. So, their formation resembled a moving fortress of shields and pikes, which allowed the men with shorter weapons to sally forth and retreat into the square. The same goes for archers, crossbowmen and gunners. All of that is very much reminiscent of the Hussite wagon fort and the Swiss pike square. But in contrast to the Hussite and early Hungarian armies, the black army relied less on war wagons to defend themselves. Their circle formation, it seems, was a combination of Hussite and Western Pike Square tactics. 
In general, the defensive nature of the circle made the best use of early gunpowder weapons while still allowing a defensive formation to move as one coherent unit. Today, a medieval circle formation is not as useful anymore in terms of defense as back in the day. Today, you need something else to protect both your privacy and the connection between your device and the internet, NordVPN, the sponsor of today's video. We like Nord because it is safe, was rated the fastest VPN in recent speed tests, and has gotten good reviews across the board. NordVPN now even comes with a threat protection feature that protects you from unwanted tracking, malicious websites, infected files, and annoying ads. You can easily turn it on via the shield icon in the left sidebar. This way, you'll be fully protected regardless of your VPN connection. NordVPN is super easy to use and can be used on up to six different devices simultaneously. Up your privacy game now and support our channel by clicking the link in the pinned comment and description and get NordVPN for two years and one month with a huge discount. All of this is entirely risk-free thanks to Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. When focusing on the Ottoman war, the most important development during the reign of Matthias was the expansion and growing importance of light cavalry forces. These came to be known as Hussars. They were mostly armed with bows, crossbows, lances, shields and sabers, and were somewhat modeled after earlier versions of light cavalry in the Balkans, but were also inspired by the Ottoman light cavalry. The origins of this kind of cavalry might be in Serbia, but this is still disputed. In any case, the Hungarians needed this light cavalry for constant raids and counter raids on the southern border. Even some of the more well-known battles, such as the one at Bradfield, were on both sides, mainly fought by cavalry. In another letter, Matthias estimated that the size of his army was around 20,000 cavalry and only 8,000 infantry. These numbers might astonish some. And, in fact, it is a common misconception that the Black Army is seen as an infantry force, while really, the opposite was true. According to Tomasz Palosfalvi, quote, This view has definitely been discredited, end quote. Of course, there were important infantry contingents, but they were mostly used on the northern and western front, as well as to occupy the many castles along the southern front. This chain of fortresses, running from Sereni all the way to Belgrade, was the real backbone of the Hungarian defense. Some of these forts had been established earlier, but they were continuously improved and were ideal bases for both counterattacks against the Ottoman raiding parties and major campaigns. The infantry was also important for the many sieges, but rarely fought in major pitched battles. On the southern front, however, there were two noteworthy examples. The sieges of Jaice in 1463, and Shabbats in 1475. But overall, the infantry branches of the Black Army were much more active on the northern and western front. There, the conflict with Frederick III had once again erupted. Here, they waged a war of attrition, with continuous sieges and small-scale attacks on fortifications. Polosfalvi explains this as follows, quote, The neglect of infantry on the Ottoman front was a necessary development insofar as the king aimed to avoid, from the very start of his reign, an open clash with the main Ottoman army, and the forces commanded by the Turkish warlords among the border were also predominantly light cavalry. Despite his tremendous efforts, Matthias simply could not take on the Ottomans by himself, and only little support came from other European states and the Pope. Well aware of this, he put most of his energy in fighting off his enemies to the north and west, in which he was quite successful in the end. The Black Army even went on the offensive and laid siege to Vienna in 1485. 17 siege guns, two siege towers and a successful infantry assault forced the city into submission. So, unlike the Ottomans a few decades later, the Black Army actually conquered Vienna. Matthias resided there until his death. His strategy of avoiding a major conflict with the Ottomans paid off when Mehmed II died in 1481. His successor, Bayezid II, was much less interested in a war against the Hungarians. However, despite a somewhat peaceful relationship with the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman border princes never ceased their raiding parties on Hungarian territory, so Matthias needed to guard his southern front permanently. Besides the Black Army's infantry corps in the north, the Hungarians had to finance another army that guarded this front. If we count the Bandarial force that could be recruited as well, Hungary had three different armies, 
most of which were in permanent use for years. Ultimately, the high maintenance cost overstretched the kingdom's finances. Tomasz Palosvalvi sums it up nicely, quote, In view of the fact that the richest monarchy in Europe, France, only made the first steps towards establishing a permanent army in the second half of the 15th century, and the Republic of Venice also long refrained from retaining great numbers of standing troops for financial reasons, it is evident that the military efforts of Matthias were groundbreaking to say the least. End quote. However, the added cost of all three Hungarian armies in general, and the Black Army in particular, were a major reason for Hungary's decline after Matthias' reign. This financial burden was simply unbearable. Hungary simply couldn't afford the Black Army any longer. It was abandoned shortly after its creator Matthias Corvinus died in 1490. Thanks for watching and thanks to our patrons for supporting the channel. If you want to join them, find the links in the description box below.